Our scripture is Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. The Lord has just healed a man who was deaf and mute, and it uh, occurred on the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee and caused great uh, response of praise at that statement, he has done all things well. And now we read in verse 1 of chapter 8, in those days when there was again a large crowd, they had nothing to eat. Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come a great, from a great distance. And his disciples answered him, Where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? And he was asking them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples to serve to them. And they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish. And after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And as they ate, and were satisfied, they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. About 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmuth, uh, Dalmanutha, the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus aware of this said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? They said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of studying it together. Let's pray. In Rome, a generation before Jesus, there was a poet named Nucretius. He was an Epicurean, a materialist, and a very modern man who was really a practical atheist. He said, gods exist, but they live in a world apart from ours and have nothing to do with us. In fact, he insisted, we are not now and we have never been worth a moment's notice from them. In other words, God or no God, we're on our own. I don't know what Mark knew of Lucretius, but his gospel gives the lie to that. According to tradition and good tradition, he wrote his gospel to Romans and sent it to Rome. What Mark revealed is very different from what the poet taught. What lots of Romans believed and what is believed in our secular age. 
that if God exists, he's uninvolved and irrelevant to our lives. Not according to Mark. God has taken notice of us. He has visited us. Mark begins his gospel with that statement. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God has come and he cares. Mark showed that in our previous text in chapter 7 when with a deep sigh Jesus healed a deaf man. He sighed with sympathy for the suffering and for what sin had done to the world he created. Now in chapter 8 Mark begins again with a demonstration that uh, the Lord takes notice and cares deeply about us when for a second time he feeds a multitude. And here he feeds the 4,000 for the same reason that he fed the 5,000, because he felt compassion for them. Satan's big lie is that God doesn't care about us. That's what he told Eve in the garden. You won't die. God's keeping the best from you. He knows that you will be like him if you eat that fruit. Well, that's the lie. The truth is in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And in Mark 8, there's another example of his love for us. I feel compassion for the people, he said. Unfortunately, the, uh, the similarity between uh, the previous feeding and chapter si in chapter 6 and, and uh, what we see here in, here in chapter 8 is seen by some to be a, a proof that this is a duplication of the earlier miracle story. And that uh, it's really the same story retold a second time. And there are similarities, but there are also significant differences between the two feedings. The, the numbers are different, the, the place they, that they occurred uh, is different, and the language used in both chapters is different. Both Mark and Matthew record the two feedings as separate and as historical. And most importantly, in verse 19 of our text, Jesus distinguished this event from the earlier feeding. And so for a second time, the Son of God takes notice of men and has compassion on them and feeds them. It reveals his care for people and his power to provide. In God's providence, that lesson was repeated for the sake of the disciples as well as to give them a lesson on the danger of false teaching, which as well was an act of compassion by our Lord for his disciples. Now the Lord and the twelve were still on the east side of the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. He had healed a deaf mute and had told him not to tell anyone, but the man could now speak and he couldn't help himself. He did just what the Lord said he should not do we can understand it somewhat. Nevertheless, the Lord said don't, and he did it. And the result was they went out and proclaimed this miracle widely. And the result was people came to see and to hear the Lord. This was Gentile country, and the crowd was largely Gentile, which is significantly different from the previous feeding, which was to a largely Jewish crowd, maybe a completely Jewish crowd in Galilee. And this crowd listened to Jesus eagerly. In verse 2, Mark says that they were there for three days. So it was something like a Bible conference with the very best speaker. They, uh, they, they wouldn't have been there long if they hadn't been engaged and enthused by what the Lord was saying, what he was teaching. He was feeding their souls. But while man does not live on bread alone, he does need bread. 
And since the people had been there a long time, three days, and since they had nothing to eat, Jesus said, I feel compassion for the people. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them will have come from a great distance. It may be true to say that it is human to have compassion. We are our brother's keeper. But even so, it is something that is quite lacking in the world. We don't live in a, compass in a compassionate world, just the opposite. But it should not be lacking in the Christian. We of all people should have compassion. It's what we see in Christ. It was characteristic of him. He felt deeply for the race in its fallen condition and in, in all aspects of its fallen condition. It is a mistake when the church cares only for people's spiritual need and neglects the material. It is a mistake when people care about people's material needs to the neglect of the spiritual. Both are the concern of the Lord. We have examples of this, I think, in our own church. Uh, we have men who uh, go out to different parts of the world where there are, the needs are great, spiritually and materially. Uh, Phil Armstrong had just returned from Cuba and last Sunday night spoke about the needs on that island and how he has visited them numerous times, but recently the needs are very great, and he goes there with sermons to preach and gives instruction when the occasion is given, but he also brings some material help and help a number of people in desperate need. The two go together. And we have other examples from our church where that occurs, where in local uh, situations, people go down to the mission with uh, material as well as spiritual help. That's the pattern, and that's what's demonstrated here. The Lord taught them, taught them for three days. He nourished their souls. That is most important. But now they need physical provision. Jesus was aware of that, but rather than meet the need immediately, he used this as an opportunity to teach his disciples. He put the problem to them and did so in the way that they had expressed it to him earlier when he fed the 5,000. It was a hint, it was a, a way of helping them to remember, to think back to what had happened earlier. So he was asking, what do you think we should do? And their answer is given in verse 4. That, uh, and, and the answer they give shows how deeply they needed the hints and the help to jog their memory. And his disciples answered, where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? Well, they understood the problem. They were in a desolate place. And the people would faint on the way home. But you can't help but wonder how they would not have known the solution since it was standing right in front of them. But then their failure to recall the, the earlier miracle really shouldn't surprise us. Nothing that we see in their failures should ever surprise us. Don Carson writing about this in his commentary on the book of Matthew in the parallel account in Matthew 15 said, we must never lose sight of a human being's vast capacity for unbelief. And that's true. And, it, and it's just that simple. It's hard for us to believe that nothing is too difficult for the Lord. It, we can teach it and we can see it in scripture and, and acknowledge it, but when the crisis comes, it's very difficult for us to believe what the Word of God reveals. It's hard to believe in His promises. It's hard to believe in His power when we face uh, a challenge. That's true of apostles. It's true of prophets. 
Elijah showed great faith on Mount Carmel when he had that contest with the prophets of Baal. He called down fire from heaven. And after the success of it all, he slaughtered 450 of those wicked prophets. But when Jezebel threatened his life, not long afterwards, his faith weakened, his courage failed, and he ran for his life. And so we all need to be re-educated continually. We need to remember the Bible is filled with the instruction to God's people to remember. It's a very prominent word in the Old and the New Testament. Remember. Israel was to remember that they were slaves in Egypt and the Lord redeemed them. Remember, that's really what they were to do every Sabbath. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord redeemed them. Remember that he provided for them for 40 years in the wilderness. Every day was a miracle for them. God provided sufficiently, more than sufficiently. Remember that. The church is to remember Christ and his sacrifice for us. Remember him routinely and often. Every Sunday evening we're to remember what he has done for us, who he is, his faithfulness, and the great sacrifice that he made for us. Why the need to remember? Because we forget. And because it is hard for us to believe. And so we need the constant reminder, the constant instruction that God cares and he provides faithfully. Here the, 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 the disciples were guided by faith or rather by sight, not by faith. They looked around and they said, yeah, we have a real problem here. This, this is a desolate place. There's no place near to get bread. The psalmist says of the Lord that he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are just dust. And the Lord knew that about his disciples, knows that about you and about me. And so, He's patient with us. He's patient. He was patient with them. And you see his patience in the way he dealt with the whole situation. He didn't rebuke them. He simply repeated the miracle. He asked how many loaves they had. Now that should have sparked some remembrance within them. Didn't. They said seven. And then he directed the multitude to sit down on the ground. He gave thanks for the bread broke it, and the disciples distributed it. Then in verse 7, he blessed a few small fish, distributed them, and verse 8 says, they ate and were satisfied, and they picked up seven full baskets of what was left over of the broken pieces, and about 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. Now, it's not a repetition of the feeding of the 5,000. There are differences in the details and a difference in the purpose. By repeating the miracle, the Lord showed, that, showed us that we can expect him to repeat his blessings for us. If he has provided for us in the past, we can expect him to provide for us in the present and in the future. We can trust him to meet our needs daily. And past blessings are evidence of that. Also, the baskets here are different from those in chapter 6. These baskets were bigger. They're called large baskets. And we get a sense of how large they were from Acts chapter 9 and verse 25 when the same word is used of the basket that was used when Paul was lowered down the wall and he escaped from Damascus. So it's a large basket. Uh, we could call them hampers that were filled with leftovers, probably indicating a much greater supply was made uh, than this left over in this second uh, miracle than in the first. But with both, the people were all satisfied with an abundance 
of leftovers. And it's a reminder, again, of the Lord's sufficiency. He repeats his blessings to us. He's always faithful to do that. And when he does it, he does it abundantly. There is no situation or need that he cannot meet with an abundant supply. This is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Certainly did there. That's the lesson here and what the disciples were to learn. The Lord is always ready to help in time of need and more than sufficient to give that help and give it precisely, give it well. He does all things well. But there's more. And the similarities between this feeding and the previous one in chapter 6 indicate that the lesson there is the lesson here that Jesus is the bread of life. And just as he had to break the loaves to feed the multitude materially, so too his body had to be broken in order to feed the world spiritually. That's foreshadowed or predicted here. But the differences are just as significant in that regard because in chapter 6, as we said, the audience was Jewish. The feeding in Decapolis was largely, if not entirely, Gentile. Putting the two together, the Lord was signifying that He came to satisfy the spiritual hunger, not only of the Jew, but the Gentile as well. He's the Savior of the world. And that leads into the rest of the passage where the Lord emphasizes the importance of the spiritual over the material. The, the loaf of life over the loaves of wheat. Immediately after the miracle, the Lord and his disciples got in the boat and they sailed over the sea to Dalman Manutha on the west shore of uh, the Sea of Galilee, just north of the town of Tiberias. The, the, the Pharisees were there. They were waiting for him. And... Uh, waiting for him with some challenges. As he got out of the boat, they began to argue with him. Mark tells us they didn't believe in him. We know that. And so they demanded that uh, he give proof that he was from God by giving them a sign from heaven. If you're sent from heaven, then send down a sign from heaven. Make the sun stand still as Joshua did or Call down fire from the sky like Elijah did. Bring down some manna like Moses. I don't doubt that they thought this was a reasonable challenge. But they already had many witnesses from miracles that he had given. He had cleansed a leper who had shown himself to the priests. They were there when he made a paralytic walk and healed a man with a withered hand. Multitudes could testify to all of the many miracles he had done for them. And then there's the miracle of the loaves and fishes, now done twice. There was no lack of miracles and signs from heaven. Their problem was a lack of evidence. It was not, I should say, a lack of evidence. It never really is that. So this was, this was not healthy skepticism. I don't think we're to believe everything we hear. I think we should be very cautious about what we believe. But there's so much evidence that they had on hand. They had seen so much themselves that this was not a case of healthy skepticism. This was blatant unbelief. Mark says they did this to test him. They didn't believe because they didn't want to believe. They had beliefs. And their beliefs were the, uh, what they were convinced to be true. The traditions of the elders that uh, man-made rules and human effort was the way to obtain the righteousness that's acceptable to God. That they could do it on their own. They could do it through their system. That's what they were trusting in. He contradicted that. So he had to be false. 
And they were just looking for ways to trip him up, looking for something that would support their claims against him. The Lord responded, not with a sign, but with a sigh. Verse 12, sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. That's the same word used in chapter 7 and verse 34 of sighing deeply before healing the deaf mute. Only this is a more intensive form of it. It's something like sighing up. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a greater, more intensive kind of sighing. But, but still, grief over sin and ignorance and, un, and the unbelief behind it. He didn't hate these men. He grieved for them. Their willfulness provoked him. I don't doubt that. He was rightly indignant. He had every right to be that because of all that he had said, all that he has done, and they still willfully rejected him and challenged him. No doubt that uh, caused some indignation, righteous indignation on his part. But his rebuke of them was not one of bitterness or anger, but one of concern. No sign would be given because signs don't cause faith. Paul put it simply in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We need the word of God is what he's saying. It was Abraham who told the rich man in hell that very fact. You remember the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man dies. Lazarus dies. They both go to their place. The rich man in the bosom of Abraham, or rather the Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham and the rich man into hell. And from there he speaks to Abraham and he says, uh, warn my brothers so that they won't come to this place. Send someone back to give that warning. And Abraham said, it wouldn't help. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. That's an amazing statement. Someone rising from the dead won't even give a person faith. And the Pharisees to whom Jesus spoke that would be the proof of that. They'd see the resurrection, know of it, and it wouldn't convince them. The Lord and the apostles used miracles to confirm the message of the gospel. That has been done. That has happened. Miracles didn't save then and they don't save now and won't save now. What we need now is what they needed then, the Word of God. It produces the faith that saves because the Holy Spirit works through the gospel to regenerate the spiritually dead to give faith. As the Gospels preach, the Spirit of God is in it. He's not in Shakespeare. He's not in Homer. He's not in any of the great poets. It's in the Word of God. And when it's preached, life is given. We need the Word of God. Another miracle wouldn't have changed these Pharisees. They, they weren't open. So Jesus refused and left. Got back in the boat with the disciples and went away to the other side. The departure was abrupt. And in the hurry to leave, the disciples forgot to bring food for the trip. Mark says in verse 14, they did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. One loaf for 13 hungry men was not really sufficient to meet their needs. And that lack of provision was on their minds when Jesus began to instruct them in verse 15. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven is not good in the Bible. It represents sin or some form of evil. Here it is a symbol of the error or false teaching of the two sects, the Pharisees on the one hand and Herod and his party on the other. 
They were very different from one another. You know that. We've discussed the Herodians and the Pharisees before. The Pharisees were legalists, and the Herodians were materialists. The Herodians really were very much like the Romans and very much like the poet Lucretius. Very, very different from these Pharisees who believed in spiritual things, believed in the resurrection, believed in angels and all of the spiritual things that the Romans, that Lucretius, that Herod and his party did not believe in. So their dogmas or ideologies were very different from one another and yet fundamentally the same in that both were forms of unbelief, forms of rejection of Scripture, rejection of Christ. What is worse, rejecting Christ and the gospel because of legalism or rejecting Christ and the gospel because of atheism? They're just different paths of unbelief that lead to the same end. What, what the Lord was telling His disciples is wherever they meet unbelief, reject it. Hold to the truth against the tide of public opinion or popular worldviews, whether they are spiritualistic or materialistic. Beware of the leaven. It was a warning given to them with all the care and compassion that he had when he fed the 5,000 and then when he fed the 4,000 and with all of the concern that he had when he let out a deep sigh. There's nothing more important than this. Error and unbelief are poison to the soul. There is no greater act of compassion or kindness than this. Warning people of the false and deadly way. But the disciples didn't catch on. They, they heard the word leaven and they took him literally when he said that. They thought <clears throat> he was speaking about the bread that they had, had forgotten to bring. That's what concerned them. Well, again, bread is important. We don't want to diminish that at all. The, the need of the stomach has its place, but the need of the soul is infinitely greater. And so Jesus corrects them with care, but with great urgency. They must get this. Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? It was a severe rebuke designed to get their attention, and it did get their attention. He continues, verse 18, having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? Then he reminds them of the two feedings. What happened up in Galilee and down in Decapolis? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? They said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. They knew all the details. They could remember all the details. They just fail to see beyond those details or, or recall them in the proper way and make the proper application to their circumstances. Their faith or their lack of faith failed them. The Lord wasn't worried about bread. He told the devil earlier, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And when the Lord spoke, the disciples were hearing every word proceed from God's mouth. They needed to concentrate on what He was teaching. That's more important than bread. The one loaf they had was more than sufficient. He could multiply that into 12 loaves or however many they needed. He and He alone is sufficient for every circumstance. That's the lesson we're being given here, at least one of the lessons. 
He ends by asking, do you not yet understand? Now that's where our passage ends. And if we just have Mark, we might wonder, well, did they understand? What happened after this? And Matthew supplies the answer because from him we learn, his account, we learned that fortunately they did get it and did understand that he was warning them against false teaching. But it took the Lord's strong language and repeated questioning of their understanding to break through their obtuse minds and redirect them from the material to the spiritual. That one loaf in the boat with them was all that they needed. And it is a kind of parable for all of this. Christ is the loaf. Christ is the bread of life. And he is all that we need. That, I think, is the ultimate lesson in all of this. Harold St. John was a brethren minister in England who told a story about walking with a friend on a Sunday morning. They were both ministers and they were headed to their respective places of worship, their churches where they would minister. And they were talking to each other along the way about the things of God when they came to a fork in the road. The right fork led to his friend's destination, an ancient abbey made of beautiful stones the names of old saints and scholars were connected to it. A practiced choir would lead the singing in crowded services. It was a, a triumph of culture and wealth, he said. The other road led to his destination, which was a simple whitewashed cottage where a few simple folk entered. His friend said, it seems incredible that you prefer that to this. He answered, it's all a question of the one loaf. His friend asked what he meant, and Mr. St. John said, supposing you have everything in perfect order in the abbey, incense, ritual, oratory, music, but the Lord Jesus remains outside, what would all of that mean to you? His friend said, it would be an empty shell. It would be. One loaf seems inadequate. It's so simple, as Christ was. He was despised and forsaken by men. He is, he is the one who is rejected by the world, yet he is what we need, and he is all that we need. He is the bread of life come down out of heaven. He himself is the sign from heaven that the Pharisees were asking for. It's in the word of God. But they didn't believe their own prophets who prophesied of that. They saw a sign from Christ rather than the word of Christ and they ignored their prophets whose prophecies were about him. So they refused to come to him. They didn't listen to the word of God, and so they didn't come to him. But all who do, all who come to Christ, will not hunger or thirst spiritually. They'll be fully satisfied as both those multitudes were when he fed them in a, de in a uh, desolate place. Well, this is the answer to every skeptic and unbeliever, every Epicurean or agnostic, every materialist or atheist, ancient or modern, that God is and he does take notice of man. He does live in a world apart from ours. He dwells in unapproachable light, that's true. Still, he chose not to live apart, but to come down from heaven in his eternal son, who then died for sinners. There's no greater act of love or compassion than that. He died for us, and he now lives for us, interceding for us every moment of our existence. We are not on our own. The one loaf is a simple picture of our Lord and of that fact. It doesn't seem like much, one loaf, but it is everything.
Christ is the bread of life. He alone is everything. He is eternal life for all who partake of him. So David invited the skeptic and unbeliever to do just that, partake of him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. All who do discover that that very thing is true. The Lord is good. So don't doubt. Don't think that we're on our own. Believe. That's all one must do. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He receives all who do. Receives them with forgiveness and everlasting life. And he blesses us and provides for us at every moment of our life. We're to live by faith and trust Him and walk by faith. May God help all of us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. We uh, come to a text like this and we may read it and be puzzled over how the disciples could be so dull in their thinking and not recognize what what we see as the obvious answer to a a situation, and yet the reality is we see ourselves in those men because we too are dull in our thinking. And we need the, the ministry of your word constantly because it's by faith that we're built up. It's through the faith in the word of God that we're built up and our faith is made strong and we're made adequate. So we pray, Lord, that you would bless us and build us up and strengthen it. Strengthen our faith for the circumstances of life and the challenges that come our way. May we live in obedience to you, faithful in everything. We pray these things in Christ's name.